Hi, Jason. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too, Nerina. You are making a movie and today we are going to speak about it. Let's start with the trailer. People sometimes don't feel true empathy for the victims of disaster because they think that they are simply a victim of where they live. Basically, there's a, an unequal distribution of risk. We look at the presidents of the countries, the mayors of the cities, they're still saying natural disasters. We just, we're not taking responsibility by saying natural disasters over and over and over again. It is their local conditions that in effect determine whether an event is a disaster or not. We have to take into account the historical context of each society and ask ourselves, why are people at risk? But I think that we are actually spending more money on constructing risk than we are on reducing risk. It is the growth engine. Consumerism for those who have the means to consume with greed on the part of the 1%. That development engine is driving us right off the edge. People are not thinking enough about the implications of the policies that they're coming up with. We will invest a great amount of money, a great amount of effort into something that will help us, but will completely destroy future generations. Hacen falta escuelas, hacen falta calles. There's lots of things that come together to shape how we see the world, which doesn't include empathy with people who are not like us. That's really the big question mark. Whether we become a civilization that takes care of each other. We're all going down or up together. We should be practitioners of justice and hope and light. The fundamental premise is that you can't solve a problem if, unless you know what causes it. You know, I often will say it's a creation of the nation state is the worst thing that ever happened to humanity. Inequalities are becoming more extreme. In times of climate change, we're going to see an increase of displacement. One of the best tools that we have is where we put our money. We were amazed of how the people got involved and supported the actions. My goal is not to see the people on the stage, but the people that are on the streets. Yes, the end is near, but also the beginning is near. Disasters can be combated by looking at some of the reasons why people are vulnerable. I think the best approach we can take is a moral approach. You can treat symptoms, but the phenomenon will continue recurring if you don't treat causes. And we realize that no disaster is natural. Why deviate? Like one of the things that I wanted to, both for myself and for the audience, is to identify positive stories of people who are coping, who are thriving, who are doing something different in, that, in circumstances which are not ideal, circumstances which might be oppressive or unjust, but they're doing something different. They're like, they're leading change, right? And so in, in, in literature, you, you find some like references to deviation or Like there's theory about positive deviance as well. It's about people who do something different, which is which changes the culture, which changes the community. And so that's kind of where I was going with with the the name, thinking about positive deviation, thinking about positive deviance, which is like people who, who make that difference, make the change. And we want the film to leave people with uh, some ideas of how they can actually deviate. Like it's we need to change direction. Like we, we have to better understand what the conditions in society are that cause people to be affected by disaster. But we also need to allow the audience to participate in doing something better. So that's the idea of the, of the name is we need to deviate and this is how you can help. What is the purpose of the movie? Well, I think... One of the key things I'm trying to do with the movie is to address some of these misunderstandings about disaster in the public um, sort of narrative and, and some of the myths that are there about what causes a disaster, what 
the impact of a disaster is how people behave in a disaster. There's so many myths about disaster which the public accepts, and uh, and a lot of times these myths and these narratives are constructed by people with power. And why this? When you when you can blame everything on the earthquake or the tsunami or the flood, um, and you you don't need to think about the social condition, then it's very very convenient for some people. Generally, for the people in power, it's very convenient for them. Um, but if we talk about uh, social natural disaster, then it becomes very um, sensitive for for people in power because they they have the the capacity to change the social condition, right? They make decisions about the social condition. So this is this is the interesting thing. You you have just spoken about moods uh, about disasters that we tend to believe. Could you give me an example? One of the good examples of a of a myth is is that people panic in disaster, um, and so you see this in Hollywood de- portrayals um, where you know a disaster happens and everybody panics and there's looting and violence and everybody's kind of um, looking after themselves and not caring about anybody else. Um, and like the reality is that this just isn't isn't what happens and in a disaster like if we look at the research and people have been studying this for decades if we look at the research about how people behave in a in a disaster they behave um with the best of human nature so to say um and you see people who are helping not only themselves and their family but complete strangers and people behave with solidarity and they they give they share with each other and they they organize and they and they save each other right and we we kind of lose this because a lot of time in the aftermath of disaster the media is, is looking like for for saviors of the people but it's not it's not like the they separate into saviors who are like the the emergency service and the victim who is the community but th- that's not a reality the reality is that the the first responders in a disaster are the community right and and most of the most of the people that are saved are saved by their neighbor and saved by people who are right there but we don't hear these stories we hear we see in the media like there's an emergency team coming from the US or coming from Japan to come in and try to rescue people i mean that's yes of course this happens but that's a very small small amount of people that are rescued by these teams um so that's kind of an example of how hollywood and um the media portray the disaster event in a way which totally misses the narrative about the community and the strength and like the the good in human in the human condition and how people actually want to to help each other and so one of my one of my favorite authors is Rebecca Solnit and she wrote a book about disasters um which which really looked at some of these things um about how people behave what what kind of stories are we going to see in the V8 the thing that most people have picked up from from movies and from the media is disasters are about hurricanes and floods and tsunamis right so that's really not what i'm looking at in this movie because my argument is we need to look deeper into society to find the root causes because those aren't the root causes those are like triggers so the root causes are are often historical they're built up over centuries in many cases um they're to do with discrimination and you know by class and race and gender um it's about politics and economics it's about colonialism and imperialism right these are the things that cause people to be vulnerable in society so the the movie will bring together these themes and try to tell a story in a simple way that people can really understand like place based examples of how these root causes cause people to be vulnerable
And then we'll be balancing those local stories, which will dominate the movie with expert commentary as well. Expert, right? So it's so-called expert, but with, with disaster scientists and with organizers and politicians and authors, or we want to talk to people who are like responsible for the narrative too. Because I think one of the, one of the things which I'm finding out more and more is that, that researchers in my own field are responsible to a large degree for perpetuating some of these myths because we, don't, we aren't challenging them in the right way. And you have just started filming in the communities, right? We started doing that aspect of the filming this year and we, we were in Vietnam, which was a great experience, very intense. We, we had a full week and I had a team locally that helped to facilitate everything. My Vietnamese is still very basic, um, so a lot of the difficulties are about understanding exactly what's going on in the interview, like conducting an interview through interpretation is, is quite tough, you know, to probe what's going on in the conversation. But at the same time, we got so much context-specific knowledge and story that I think it will be quite powerful. We just don't know exactly how it will come together yet. If we start looking for stories, we find them, right? Yeah, you know yourself, when, when you work with creatives, you have other ideas. It's sometimes hard to keep focused. So one of the things which came through was that there was lots of content about war and lots of content about like legacy of violence and trauma. And I don't know if this will really fit too much in Deviate, but we're thinking of doing a short movie about that because we went to a revolutionary museum about the war and about, you know, people's experiences in prison and torture. And then we talked to families of, that are affected by Agent Orange um, as well. And some of the, the issues of that, we talked to veterans on the U.S. side as well that, that were living in Vietnam and talked about some of the traumas and the, the kind of strength of Vietnamese society as well. So we have so much content about that. And so we're kind of thinking we might do a short feature about this too, because we have some great stuff, but it might not fit in the, in the Deviate movie. And uh, how about Deviate? What are we going to see from Vietnam? In terms of other themes that we covered, like one of the really interesting ones was looking at informal settlements in Hanoi, which is a, obviously a big city, very rapidly urbanizing. But one of the features of cities like Hanoi in Asia is that you have this rural to urban migration. So we looked at a, a prominent settlement right in the center of Hanoi, which is along the Red River. And, and so that settlement has grown from like 400 families a couple of decades ago, which was quite formalized to over 2,000 families. And a lot of the settlements right along the river are informal or illegal. And so we talked to people in the community about like what's going on and what the impact of that is and got some fantastic um, content just exploring that idea of urbanization and migration and you know why do people migrate and what risk does it cause and how does it change society there Um, so I think there's some, there's some great stuff there looking at some of those key um, themes. Could you tell me more about this? Some of the things which were, are very common across the region are um, this idea of growing cities, mega cities, you know, urbanization, migration into cities, informal settlements, ecological destruction through development as well with these economies that are growing so rapidly. We talk to economists there and look at what is the impact of this ideology of growth because the inevitable outcome is, is generally destruction of the environment and marginalization of people who are in the way as well. So in Vietnam, that means a lot of ethnic minority groups are affected by development projects. Sometimes they, they just are moved to different locations or they're put at higher risk of flooding. So yeah, those are some of the, some of the things. Oh, climate change as well, you know, vulnerability in, in that sense. 
Vietnam is one of the most um, prone countries to the impacts of climate change. Um, and they're, they're also in, in a region or in a location which experiences a lot of heavy rainfall and um, flooding and landslides and cyclones. So they experience many of the triggers too. So we need locations that have structural injustice in society, which causes people to be vulnerable and marginalized and lack access to the things that protect them from, from hazards. Because that's a big difference, right? So in, in many countries, you have these hazards, but the people who live there have access to the resources and services that they need to be safe, functioning um, public services, functioning infrastructure, access to like energy, access to health and education. Um, all of these things make make people much more secure. In a country like Vietnam, many people don't have the access to those things. Um, as well, Vietnam, I think, was interesting to us from the point of view of some of the legacies of the conflict as well. And, and how, I mean, in every society, generally, they have their narratives about solidarity and strength of community. But in Vietnam, it has a particular flavor, which I think is interesting. You do see those aspects of community which are very strong there and, and powerful. What is this particular sense of community? One of the, the kind of key terms in my field is resilience, right? And we talk about resilience quite a lot. And it's, it's obviously co-opted by almost everybody. And it's used in very funny ways by um, the forces of neoliberalism also. But... But it's still a useful term. And um, but one of the things that we find in, in research is that many of the communities without access actually are, show a lot of like connection and help each other. And so, so it's, a, it's a tension because sometimes you try to define like what, what you're looking for in terms of showing that people are resilient. And actually some of these very vulnerable communities display a lot of these characteristics which are more about connection and network and, um, and like their behavior of, of sharing and community. And sometimes these people don't even feel threatened by hazard because they say, well, we, we, ha we do what we do and it's just life and we recover, and, you know. But um, in, in other countries where you don't have some of those characteristics in community, people are, are safer, right? Even though they don't, behave in, in that way or help each other. Um, a lot of people, the more access they have and the more resources that they have, um, sometimes they actually, their, their human behavior changes to become more selfish, right? So sometimes it's the people without, without anything who are most at risk, who, um, who behave in a, in a more humane way. This is perhaps one of the biggest challenges to have a sustainable development and to preserve the positive aspects of the different, of the different communities and cultures. There, there are certainly challenges there to, to like that assumption that, that more development will allow people to, um, to, eliminate like risk or vulnerability and um, because what we find in many situations is that um, yeah people people gain access to to more resources but what they do at that point is sometimes give in to like the idea that the more you have the more you should consume and so I mean, this is, this is something that, that comes through quite strongly in Vietnam, and a lot of people that we talk to are very concerned about the development paradigm there and how there's so much onus on economic growth and on rapid development, trying to, you know, it's their turn, like it's their turn to develop because they've been kept down for so long, you know, after the war really you had a period of economic warfare on Vietnam. So they were very underdeveloped by the 90s, you know. 
So a lot of people there, or I mean, the government is always pushing this development agenda, and and people are seeing the negative impact, but but many people are enjoying the additional wealth and and economic opportunity that they have as well. So I think it's just healthy to talk about the tensions there, and like I've heard lots of people. That are concerned that they might lose the community solidarity、um, that they have as people become more individualistic and consumerist, and I think this is true, and、um, it's, it's a it's a really challenging topic in Vietnam, and some of it is generational.、Um, a lot of the older generation think that the younger generation are embracing. Western values of individualism and freedom, and and so they see that as a negative thing. So it's it's a tension. It's not like one thing is right and one thing is wrong, but、um, it's it's healthy to have this conversation. I think you are going to play in the movie as well. I didn't really think that I would be in the movie like before we started filming, and then the more we talked about it, we got to a point where just like, yeah. That, It has to be partly about the discovery of the the filmmaker, you know, and because we're telling stories, and there's so many things that are that will come out that are surprising. You have to also convey that to the viewer, like how how the movie has changed me as a researcher, and so that's become more of a prominent thing in in Deviate. Is like is like what a what a I experiencing. So one of the things we're doing for that is, like during after filming, say certain interviews,、um, we'll we'll sit down and reflect and talk about it. Making a movie is of course a journey. Is this also a personal one? Yeah, for sure. One of the things which is definitely a journey for me is finding those positive stories, finding how people are making a difference. And inspiring change in their communities, because I guess after ten years of researching in this area, it's it's easy to be cynical about like the possibilities for change. So part of the journey for me was, or is, I I really want to know for for my own、um, in my own mind that I can be hopeful, right? Because. It's easy for me to be to be very down about the state of、um, society and the state of the planet,、um, and think, well, you know, we're, all of the work is meaningless because we're still we're still so screwed. So, but but part of the journey for me is finding these stories which which give me the inspiration to keep fighting and to keep hopeful.、Um, so, yeah, it's a it's a great journey and.、Um, I feel a lot more, a lot more positive than I did when I started. Thank you, Jason. It's really good to talk about, and、um, we're really excited to hopefully finish the movie this year.、Um, and we look forward to to actually bringing that to the public. And I hope people will、um, appreciate what we're trying to do with it. Thank you, Jason, for this conversation, and I really look forward to this movie. Okay. Thanks, Serena. Bye bye.